Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, I am not going to be long. You saw, first and foremost, you saw the intro to this uh, particular episode, a segment. You know that we are in the midst of a fundraiser. You know uh, the importance of the work. Go to the description box and show some love and show some support. None of the things that we have done for over 30 years is done for free. It costs and the price of not getting it done is a failure to achieve what's more than achievable and I don't even want to get into it but we can't keep complaining about being oppressed when we are funding the oppression and starving the uh, the revolution period you can say all the things you want to say. You can be as upset and, 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 and flabbergasted with everything that's going on, but you can't keep funding your demise while starving uh, your empowerment, your revolution. The people who are putting in the work are being told, you don't have it, we can't do it, man. And then you're looking up and it's all these posts about all these things and it's all flowing through the white economy. And that white economy is starving black communities and gentrifying them. And that's just the, the basis of it. But that's not why I'm here. But um, let me just move on. But if you uh, believe in the work we've done, again, I've been in this game for a long time. Over 78,000, closing in on 80,000 hours of research. Um academic scientific research into multiple uh, areas of concern within the black community I have done everything I can to disseminate it in every way possible uh, I have used it to create solutions I have uh, presented those solutions I have created programs to implement those solutions and the bottom line is I'm one man I'm going to do what I do until I take my last breath. But imagine what could happen if we could solidify, unify, build, grow. What if I could teach just 100 men the things I know about African-American, adolescent, and young adult male violence? How to mitigate it, how to slow it down, how to reverse it. What if I could teach just 100 men and they could take it and then do the same? But it takes resources uh, that's not why I'm here <laughs> here is why I'm here I want to first of all clarify something that uh, I said on the initial video surrounding John Morant not s something specifically I said but I want to clarify my stance uh, it's easy for people who don't watch an entire video or simply read the comments or read the um, title of a video or a post or an article or whatever and draw a conclusion and run off and say what was done and all of this. Uh, I want to be very clear here. I never condemned or attacked John Morant. 
I said that he needs better people in his circle. I said that it's obvious that his father was there for him and helped nurture his athletic development, but they are probably more like brothers than father and son. And that lack of wisdom and maturity on his father's level is reflected in how he's behaving with his father that close to him. Now, obviously, you get a kid away from home. They're not the same person they are at home. Uh, how far they get away from that depends on how well they have been developed and what they know. But when you got pops right there, their houses are next to each other. They are constantly with each other. So he's accountable, but obviously... It's not something that he feels he got he had, he either has to answer for or that it's that big of a deal. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to get to what Stephen A. Smith said about it. And I'm going to address that. But I want to be very clear here. I don't think that we need to drag our men or our boys for their mistakes because we've all made them we don't need to applaud stupidity but we don't need to get out and drag them and act like we haven't made bad decisions poor choices and i i said that numerous times in the previous video that i've made choices that i'm not happy with and i was a lot older than 22 probably the worst choice i ever made in my life i was in my early 30s so that is the reality of it. It's not about saying I need you to be perfect. It's about saying understand what you are. And this isn't simply about uh, him being a role model. This is about understanding that you are a representation of the black male. And there is an idea of how our men are. And it leads to things because our men are seen as hyper violent, with a natural proclivity of bent towards violence and dangerous. When you present an image like that, it's read that way. It reinforces the idea. It enheightens the fear in other people, whether you believe it or not. There are people that are naturally afraid of us solely based off of false narratives and images that are put out about us. And the average black man isn't going to harm you if you don't harm, if you don't threaten something he's going to do. Now, he will touch you. If he feels like you violated a certain space, a certain code, a certain a point of respect, proximity to what he cares and loves, he will touch you. But just going out and saying, I'm going to destroy something just for the sake of destroying it, that's not the average black man. But that is the image put out. And when you sit up and you, you're in the open and brandishing a weapon, it reinforces that. And it's unfortunate that every black man carries the banner for all black men because it happens in no other race. Nobody's sitting up going when you hear something horrible uh, on the news and they haven't shown the mugshot yet. Nobody else, no other race is saying, I hope it's not a black man. It's up black people because we know we bear the identity of every other black person we are going to be associated with it. It's just simply the way it is. It's a psychological phenomenon. I've been paying attention to it since I was a kid. I've studied it. I've written about it. It's real. But the flip side of that is people are looking at it and they're going, going to judge all of us based on it. Now, that's still not the breast of what concerns me. What concerns me is you're looking at a kid that is about to kick in a 200 and something million dollar deal, guaranteed salary, starting next season. Part of his extension. Crazy money. And trying to associate with and stay connected to this idea of being something that doesn't produce anything but death in prison for the sake of having street credibility, street credibility is a notion that we need to get all of our young black boys away from. Oh, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not about 
assimilating into the notion of the Eurocentric idea of what we should be. I'm not trying to be palatable to white people. I'm trying to be respectful to my community, to my heritage, so that the women in my community can look at me and respect me and see. I'm trying to look so the young people can look at me and say, that's something to aspire to. Not of that because you're talking to a person as far as fitting in you're talking to a person that never fit in you're talking to a person uh with with many tattoos uh the biggest one is written across the entire top of my back from shoulder to shoulder it says renegade and underneath it says ride or die i have never been someone who was a fit in type person uh, i've been told you can't go to that meeting with a hoodie on watch me and it's not about that if, if that's the way you want to push back, push back. Wear your hoodie. Wear whatever you want to wear. Get your tattoos, whatever you want to wear. We broke that barrier. Allen Iverson tore it down, to, much to the chagrin of Stephen A. Smith, who is comparing John Morant to Allen Iverson. Um, and it's just like Stephen A. Smith has been pegged with the responsibility of keeping us black athletes in line, you know, Toe the line, act like, act respectable. Do you know? My thing is, what I'm wearing has nothing to do with respectability except for the fact that you want me to wear something different. I'm not harming anyone with what I wear. Now, Jai having a gun is a problem. And here's why it's a problem. We had this conversation earlier, and someone was trying to tell me that it, you know, where he was was, uh, open carry and for whatever reason it was okay to have it in a, a, an establishment with alcohol i've never seen that before and i've made myself pretty familiar with the the gun laws uh in any state that i'm going to travel in and i've never seen it where you can be in an establishment and leak that's, that's serving alcohol and legally possess a firearm and not be law enforcement uh definitely can't consume alcohol it doesn't matter whether you're intoxicated or not you can't consume it and have possession of a firearm even in states where you have a license to carry can't do it um it's a violation of the law and you can be fined or arrested well whether that's the tr truth or not what i can tell you is now that the police have gotten involved and see this is what i was talking about something starts off as something simple you have to understand you're not simple the average cat could actually shoot that on uh instagram run it live ain't nobody caring 100 people see it maybe even a thousand people see it no big deal one of the best basketball players in the league one of the fate one of the uh developing faces of the league one of the most exciting players to watch in the league is in the club with his shirt off, waving a gun. That's going viral. And now it's not only going viral on social media, it's going viral in mainstream media and the police department's got a hold of it. So now they're launching an investigation. So obviously, there's something to be concerned about on the legal end. Now, again, the argument was it was just two game suspension. Anything that's going to take you away from the thing you say you love, you've got to be very careful about it. There's some things that I'm willing to sacrifice the thing I love. If I were to get suspended from doing something, there are some things I'm going to stand on, some things I'm just not going to back off of. Sitting up brandishing a firearm isn't one. There are some things I'm willing to do time for. Sitting up and just openly brandishing a firearm for no apparent reason isn't one. My thing is, this is simply as I stated in the first, uh, the first video. It's a microcosm of a much bigger issue. It's 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 a need for us to be more present in our communities as men. It's a need to define black manhood black masculinity in a way that we understand who we are this is what happens when young men are trying to find their identity it's when they are trying to establish a platform of respect on which they can stand and there's no true definition or uh or 
model from which you can universally measure yourself. So you've got all these different scheme, uh, schisms and, and, and sects that are defining manhood. You've got the, 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 the macho, how many people, how many chicks I can, I can knock down manhood sect. You got the how many bodies I got sect. You got the who got the bag sect. You got who's got the charisma in the game set. And then you've got over here the men who are trying to protect and hold it down in the community set. Now, the thing is, you've got way too many ways that you can define manhood in these sex, in these schisms, in these divisions, in this ambiguity. Am ambiguous idea of masculinity is all these ways and then you got these young boys with a lack of men in their presence trying to find the way well what's getting praised the most well rap music is showing uh sexual promiscuity uh misogyny drug use and violence they getting praised for it the movies are showing violence Hell, you got a number of women out here that don't want a dude that's clean cut, that's vested. He's too boring. He's he's too dry. It's it's you know, I saw someone and I, I'm hoping that it is it was a joke, but they were talking about how uh blah blah Michael B. Jordan is. You know, they were joking. They were saying he probably knows exactly where his birth certificate is. You know, he said he's got the original one, not the copy. It's, you know, so it's almost like irresponsibility is praised. You know, I, it, 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 it's this push from a certain group of women, not all, because I know a lot of my sisters want a solid man that hold them down and love on them. And that's what matters. And they want to feel safe. They want to feel, feel cared for. But there are some sisters out there that just want to live on the edge. And that, again, comes from a lack of identity. That's that identity crisis that's impacting us all. Something I've talked about, something I've taught on, something I've written on extensively in multiple books, and something I've worked extremely hard to develop intervention processes and systems to help us overcome. Dr. Michael Blanchett, uh, one of my close friends and a colleague, someone that I've spent a lot of time around. Um, we used to have a conversation, I mean, years ago, and he would say, Doc, my, my biggest worry, my biggest concern is that people aren't going to realize the value in you, what you bring to the table until you're gone or until you're almost gone until they've used you up and you're a shell of what you are and then they'll start giving you like we do all of our ancestors like we do and my response was that's okay i'm good with it i'm not here for the praise i'm not here for the accolades i know who i am i've put in my work i've enjoyed my life i'm not here for any of that i said if my legacy is they know who I was and they realize the impact I had on this world after I'm gone. Then my kids will live with an understanding and an influence of my legacy and I'm good with that. I, I, I don't need anybody to stroke my ego. I don't need anybody to validate my position or my worth or anything else on this world. I know who I am. So, But, but what he's saying it, 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 it should have some concern because there are men on this planet that look like us, me and Doc, that are loving hard, protecting hard, fighting hard. And the ones that they tend to highlight are the ones that are leaving a trail of destruction, pain, abandonment. That has to change because this isn't even an issue. 
if we do what we're supposed to do. Maybe we are not even an issue where we're having to worry about it, but we are. We're here. And, you know, and Stephen A. Smith is talking about, you know, uh, chill out and all this stuff like that. And a lot of what Stephen A. Smith said, and those of you who know me know, I do not cut for this dude in the slightest. I think he's trash, but the truth even comes out of the mouth of a liar sometimes. Jai has way too much to lose and way too many opportunities to influence. And I don't think we place enough accountability and responsibility on the backs of our young men. I'm not talking about overloading them and putting the whole world on their back and saying, it's your job to fix it. No, it's all of our jobs to fix it. And we can't rest the soul load on somebody just because they're famous. But we need to have a responsibility. We need to have a code. Not because of them but because of us. Because if they suspend him indefinitely, because right now it went from a two-day suspension. It went from two, him stepping away for a couple of days to him being suspended for a couple of days to him not having a time frame of when he's going to come back to him now being investigated by the police department. That's how fast things go out of... Uh, out of you know, out of control. And man, think about Johnny Manziel and the hell that white kid raised. And it got him out of football. I think he's like in arena football now. It got him out the NFL. But he didn't get the same scrutiny for his escapades as John Moran is getting as Dennis Rodman got back in his day. Uh, and that's just simple. It, it They want you to shut up and dribble. They want you to shut up and throw the ball. They want you to shut up and run the ball. They want you to shut up and score and rebound. They, they, they don't want you to express your uniqueness. They don't want you to display your humanity. They don't want any of that. They don't want you feeling like you are that man. That scares the shit out of them. And so they have ways of breaking you. They have ways of taking it away. And they use it the same way that they used lynching a long time ago. Lynching wasn't simply about punishing the person that they were lynching. It was about sending messages to anybody else that had the idea of being audacious enough to stand up and do something they didn't like. And what we have to understand, and until we have ourselves or put ourselves in a position of power where we can sit up and operate with autonomy, where we can sit up and do things in a way that benefits the whole as well as benefits us individually, we've got to be careful. We've got to be strategic. If we're going to operate in their world, we got to know how the game is played. We've got to know the traps that are set because there's nothing they would like to say is we gave this fool 200 million dollars and he threw it away trying to be a gangster now anybody that understands the dynamic within the community knows it's not that simple anybody that's come out of the community knows the pool i came out of the hood i know the pool it's by the grace of God that I was able to break free, and it wasn't easy. There's a part of it still in me. And it's an everyday fight to press it because there are certain things that still test me. And there's still a part of me that hasn't grown enough to know I don't have to prove to you that I'll touch you. It's a part of me that just by the disrespect alone, I want to touch you. But I've grown enough and I know the long-term consequences of getting out of line for something that really isn't as important. And we make all of these little decisions on the fly. And... I don't expect a 22-year-old to have all the answers. I don't expect a 22-year-old 
to be able to sit up and distinguish what's a good decision, a smart decision. I, I want you to be able to know when you're putting your entire future at risk, though. You know, and you're starting to compile a list of infractions all along the same lines. Gunplay and violence. Let it go. Let it go. I'm pretty sure you got some cats that can put in work for you if that's what's necessary. Don't don't get caught up in the game. But um, I just wanted to, first and foremost, put it out there. I'm, I'm all for this kid. I'm pulling for him. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that he gets it together. I love the support he's getting from Etan uh, Thomas, from uh, Jalen Rose, from people who come from places and understand that it's not as easy as they want to make it. And the... Let me, let me give you a, an example of what you're looking at. You grow up in uh, an environment where the reality is lack, poverty, fate, violence, drug use. Uh, you grow up there, and your whole goal is to make it out. But the entire time that you're growing up there, you are aware of an entire different spectrum of the world that isn't experiencing what you're experiencing, but knows what you're going through and isn't doing anything to help or to stop it or to make it better. In many instances, they are contributing to it. And then all of a sudden, you have this gift or this opportunity to step out of it and do unbelievable things and take your life to a whole nother level, but it thrusts you right into that environment of the people who knew about your suffering. And they're supposed to be your friends now, right? And you're supposed to forget all the people who suffered with you but weren't as talented enough at what you do to get where you've gotten. And you know that he's hearing. You Don't forget about us. Don't act like you don't know us. And all of this other stuff, let me tell you something. That's a hard transition. And finding your balance in loving the people you know you belong to and dealing with the people you know you have to deal with isn't easy. But it's necessary until we get to a point to where we build our own. And it doesn't look like we're anywhere close to making moves like that. And I'll be damned if I'm going to demand anybody to shut their shit down to prove to me they're black. Because, see, I know what it's like to try to get black people to support you. So I'm damn sure not going to tell somebody, man, uh, I was you, I wouldn't play. If I was you, I'll walk away from the game. If I was you, I'll quit. Why in the hell would I tell you that? Because the people that you're sitting up saying you represent won't hold you down. I can tell you that from 30 years in the game, they're not going to hold you down. They'll call you a sellout, but if you stand strong and, uh, and, and, and go hard in the pain about your blackness, they'll just praise you, click like button, and clap. But actually sitting up saying, I'm going to get in, I'm going to see you, I see what you're doing, I see how you represent us, I know that it's hurting your brand to be doing what you're doing, so here's what we're going to do on your behalf. That's, that's not So I'm never going to sit up and say, hey, go tell those people to kiss your ass. No. How many other places can you get 230-something million over five years? And we could talk about selling your soul and all that shit like that. Ain't nobody feeding my family but me. So every time I make a decision, I'm making the decision understanding the gravity of it and how it impacts my ability to provide for mine. The decisions I've made that's cost me money because I've gone black, I made that choice, but I damn am not going to push it on nobody else. 
I've lost clients. I've lost international clients because I wouldn't take certain videos down or certain articles down. That article that I ripped about the prancing elites six, seven, eight years ago, damn, it might be eight, nine years ago by now. Time flies. But when I wrote that article, I had not just the LGBTQ community coming at me. I had a number of other interests that were being supportive of it came at me. And I was told to take that article down. That motherfucker is still up. And I'm, and I'm not doing it to start beef because I got people I love who are part of that community. But I got a right to have my opinion about how it's influencing my people. And all I'm saying is do you, but I'm going to do me and you don't get to control that. And if that, remember I, t I told you, there are certain things I go to the mat for. My right to speak my mind is one. You don't get to control that. I'm not going to go out and purposely hurt anyone. But I'm going to speak my truth. And I'm going to speak it in love because I love my people. And if I think enough to speak something out loud, it's because I think it's impacted my people. Because I don't, I don't talk to him myself. Talk as much as I talk. I'm always talking with the purpose of empowerment. The people who hang around the places that I chill at, that I'm just in my zone and I'm chilling. They'll tell you. He don't hardly say nothing. But when you get him going, it's times I sit there and, and people think, you don't say nothing. And my, my response is, I talk enough. But when they get me on a point that I'm passionate about and I get to going, I'm on it because it's that thing. And I don't have to be out here to be heard. I'm out here to make a difference. And so I'm not going to ask any of these cats to make a statement with their pocketbook with money I can't replace to prove a point to people who are never going to hold them down. At the same time, be careful where you lay, the, who you lay with, who you sleep with, who you climb in the bed with. And I'm not talking sexually, I'm talking uh, metaphorically. Because you, just as easy as they'll lie, lie in your pocket, they'll cut your throat. And you've got to know how they do that. And that's the thing with me is we need to do a better job of preparing these young brothers. One of the things back when I was still messing around with sports, um, there were a bunch of young brothers that were coming into the league, basket, not basketball, but football, that I got to spend time around and help mentor. Uh, I'm not going to call their names, but these were not scrubs. These were top draft picks. They all went first round. And fortunately for them, the agency that represented them, again, I'm not going to say any names, knew enough to put them around people who were going to allow them to experience and have fun, but keep them from doing stupid shit. That's what needs to happen. In this case, one of the buddies that I, I, I check in on every now and then is one of the guys who was responsible for that. And we were close. We were tight. We still kick it. And, uh, you know, he's he's got obviously we're not that far apart in age. So he's gotten up uh, and he's probably gotten away from that because, man, I'm telling you, we sitting up babysitting these kids and they want to hit strip clubs and they laughing at me because I'm in that motherfucker sleep because I get nothing out of strip club. Just never been my thing. But that's where they want to go. We're going to take them that, but we're going to make sure they ain't doing no stupid stuff that freaks off their career. Now, it happens that Jai was in a strip club. See, if I'd have been in that with him, like, no, nah, man, let me get that. He wouldn't even been able to get in. Let me get that from you. You don't need that in there. You, you good. Ain't nobody coming at you. You good. Have a ball. But don't, we're not doing that. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm in the strip club, knocked out. Not, nothing there for me. 
you know, now I did the club for a while. The club thing, yeah, the strip club thing just wasn't me. Unless they had good food, good seafood, then I'm good. But just rolling up in that, that that's never my, no. I've had a situation one time where the person I was with was like, hey, man, my brother coming down. He want to go to the strip club. I'm like, oh, you go, go with him, have fun. I'm like, so it wasn't that, you know, I had a, my, my woman had a problem with it. It wasn't my thing. But I said all that to say, look, we need to have the right people around the people that we say we care about. This is a 23-year-old kid, 22, 23, something like that. And I think he just turned 23, about to turn 23. He's a kid. And he's a multimillionaire, about to be extremely rich. He's rich now. He's about to be extremely rich. And you know the shit that goes through your mind of what you can do when you got money flowing through your hands? I've never had 200 million coming my way all in one while. But I've, I've been blessed. And I'm telling you, you start to feel a little uh, impervious. You start to feel like you can't be touched until you are. Trust me. We need to do a better job of caring for, taking care of, leading, building, empowering our youth. I cannot stress that enough. Um, my prayers are with Jai, with his family, with the team. Uh, I'm hoping that nothing comes of this police investigation that could ultimately derail his career. Um, you know, but you know how it goes. Um, so this is why it's important. We don't get to make the mistakes they get to make especially not on that level. We don't have the level of privilege that they have. So when we pave our road for success, we've got to be very careful to guard it with all diligence. And that's my thing I'm preaching. That's what I'm talking. Not holding someone to some unrealistic expectation, but saying, hey, somebody's got to be in your corner to make sure you're not crashing. With that being said, like I said at the beginning, if you believe in what we've been doing for th more than three decades, primarily funded by me, yeah, um, show some love. Go to the, uh, the uh, description box, wherever you're going to see this at, and there will be several ways to give. You choose the way you want to give, whether it's cash app, whether it's the link directly to the organization, or if you one of the people who prefer to do it, GoFundMe, which I'm not crazy about because of the processing fees, but whatever floats your boat. But here's the thing. If we're ever going to truly be empowered, we're going to have to get out of this thing where we sit up and we'll go throw money at them like crazy and then sit up and look at the people who are actually doing the work and go, man, I wish you the best. Until it's your person that needs, to, somebody you love that needs what they do. And then you are all about why you can't help me. What, what, you know, you know, what are you there for? And the thing is, everything comes from something. And when you're not feeding and feeling that something that it's coming from, eventually it runs out. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Thank you guys for letting me speak on this. Um, leave your comments in the comment field. Click the like button. Click the share button. Subscribe. Donate. Don't make me come find you.